Hello and welcome to the Growing Pulses in 2019 webinar series. Today we're going to be talking about mitigating the risk of harvester fires, particularly in a pulse crop environment. Uh, this webinar has been re-recorded to overcome a couple of audio issues we had with the original uh, and uh, hopefully you can hear me loud and clear. This series is brought to you by the GRDC Southern Pulse Extension Investment. Um, it's delivered by a consortium of researchers, agronomists, farming systems groups, growers and pulse experts to increase the knowledge of growers and advisors on sustainable pulse production, improving the southern region's capacity to maximise future growth and profitability opportunities. My name is Ben White. I've worked in the area of harvester fires for some time, having worked with the late Dr. Graham Quick on the topic. Uh, I also do a lot of work with the Condon Group and uh, I manage the research program there and also am the editor of Farming Ahead magazine. Um, uh, harvester fires are a topic that's pretty close to my heart. Um, that harvester there is actually a, a harvester that was owned by my uncle um, at uh, the caught fire about 10 years ago and obviously, as you can see, destroyed the machine. Um, I am from a, har a farming background and, uh, and I, I do understand how harvester fires can happen and how they happen very quickly. Uh, and obviously, uh, the fact that they can be dangerous not only uh, for the operator but for others uh, if that fire spreads. So we want to focus a little bit today on, on minimising the risk of harvester fires and just look at some of the practical options we've got for doing so. But first I thought we'd have a quick look at some survey data that the Condini Group collected um, from both uh, growers and also from contractors. Uh, we had a range of machines uh, uh, that, that are covered in this survey, so pretty much every make and model uh, that you'll find out in the paddock these days, and a pretty good spread of the, the major brands here as you can see. Uh, in total we had uh, about 300 harvesters represented in this, uh, in this survey. Um, 270 complete responses, uh, some contractors, some farmers, as I mentioned before. Interestingly, 81% uh, of, uh, of those machines uh, were road registered. Uh, but harvesters can be uh, pretty devastating and we can lose machines. So here's an indication of, uh, of harvesters lost in the last uh, few years. Uh, those in black are 100% loss um, and harvester fires, unfortunately, uh, tend to propagate uh, uh, particularly when we've got uh, lots of biomass, big crops and, uh, and a lot of dust and uh, depending on the crop type that, uh, that can vary significantly. So let's look at crops uh, and their influence on harvester fires. Um, what we would expect is, is pulses obviously uh, one of the highest uh, incidents of, of harvester fires. These are uh, harvesters that have uh, had a smaller, a smaller event uh, in the last 12 months. Uh, chickpeas, as you can see, quite high. Uh, cereals, lentils, um, closely behind them. But as I say, the, the pulse crops are, are where we need to really focus our attention, particularly in South Australia and Victoria, uh, where we've got lentils growing. Uh, they tend to be particularly fire prone. Uh, some of the, the research work uh, done by the late Dr. Graham Quick did suggest that lentils can be up to five times more flammable than cereals. So something we need to be very aware of. But I suppose when we look at historically what has contributed to harvester fires, uh, it's a, an area that uh, we've been working on for some time. And if we look back at 2005-06 survey, you'll see that dust and trash buildup and bearing failure um, stand out pretty dominantly in those uh, statistics. Um, moving to 2011-12, again dust and trash build up and I think you're starting to see a pattern here with bearing failure as well. Uh, and this most recent survey, uh, again uh, those two things are very high on the list in terms of what contributes to harvester fires. Um, specifically if we look at the contributors, that dust and trash build up, a third of respondents suggested that uh, that dust and trash build up uh, issue was uh, around the exhaust system. Um, any areas of low air velocity that could be on the front where you might have hydro motors there that, that uh, run pretty pretty hot. Um, and also any areas where fuel and, and lubricants can, uh, you know, drips and, and leaks can retain dust. So um, dust and tra trash build up uh, definitely uh, probably the, the one thing that we can stay on top of to, to minimise our risk uh, of a harvester fire. The other is bearing failure as we mentioned and 13% and of uh, of survey respondents indicated that bearing failure was responsible for a, for a harvester fire. Um, worn bearings uh, obviously generate heat as they approach failure. It's very difficult to sense when that's going to be um, and there are some tools that we can use to, uh, to identify when a bearing is about to fail. 
Uh, electrical systems only 2%, nevertheless it's something we can keep an eye on. Um, rubbed insulation, rodent damage, overloaded circuits are all the sort of things that contribute to, uh, to harvester fires. Uh, fuel flammability is, as I mentioned, um, something that's, that's really quite uh, topical and, and something that we don't quite know a lot about. Um, there are some questions around uh, you know, why it is that, that some seasons uh, are worse than others from a harvest of fire perspective. Uh, is it that um, it's a varietal impact or, or perhaps um, surfactants or GAs that we put on, uh, on the crop? There's a little bit of knowledge there, uh, uh, I guess a knowledge void there that we still need to address. One thing we do know, uh, obviously, is that, uh, that that lentils are a particular concern when it comes to harvester fires. We can see here some data where we've got ignition points, and there's been, been some work done on where those ignition points are. Uh, as you can see here, we've got uh, uh, some some jumbo lentils um, uh, igniting at just above that 200 degree mark. I, I should add that some of the work that, that Dr. Quick did suggested that. Um, that lentils uh, could ignite as low as 130 degrees. Now that's pretty scary stuff, um, but it uh, it means that we we then at least have a, a, a benchmark that we need to uh, to work on in, in terms of what we need to try and keep cool uh, on the harvester and or keep very clean. Um, I am going to mention, uh, and I've called it the IHSD issue, but it's it's uh, it's across whether you've got an IHSD or a seed terminator uh, or even um, some of the harvest weed seed. Uh, control modifications, whether they're um, chaff decks or, or uh, you know, chaff lining shoots. One of the issues is that manufacturers spend a lot of time and money uh, trying to ensure that, that harvester airflow uh, keeps the machine as clean as possible. If we do alter that, we can cause some issues. And in particular, where we've got uh, issues with uh, harvesters fitted with uh, mechanical weed seed control uh, options at the rear, we um, are generating, generating a lot more fine dust, as you can see in that photo there, a couple of machines running uh, some weed seed mills. Now, uh, what we do need to, to do, obviously, in, in those sort of conditions is stop and clean down more regularly. If we're, we're creating more dust, and that's what we're doing with these units, we need to, uh, need to stay on top of it. Uh, the other contributor is obviously heat. Um, as I mentioned, uh, 130 degrees is, is where we've seen some ignition points. Um, very easy for components on a harvester exhaust system to uh, exceed so exceed that uh, well and in, uh, up into the three four hundred degree mark. Um, you know, not just exhaust. We also need. I've also measured uh, things like intercooler intake pipes uh, getting well above that one hundred and thirty degrees too. So there are a range of, of areas on a harvester. Again, that's different for every machine. It's different depending on the emission control systems on those machines as well. So. Uh, there are some, some significant contributors there that we need to, uh, to, need to consider. Um, the obvious one, ambient heat, uh, low humidity, uh, windy conditions, all contributors to uh, the, uh, the propensity for, for harvester fires. One I will mention a little bit further on is static. Um, static gets blamed quite regularly for harvester fires, but uh, I am here to tell you that uh, uh, st the static won't cause a fire, it won't start a fire. Um, it may contribute in other ways. So, so how can we be proactive in preventing harvest fires? Uh, obviously, you know, regular clean down, monitoring bearings, but thinking about some heat shielding options to to minimise that heat. Uh, looking after our electrical system, fuel system. We'll talk about static, and I also want to talk about maintaining airflow across the machine, just to make sure that things are kept clean uh, in a, in a running environment. So regular clean down, um, basically what we can do is uh, make sure we do this regularly. Harvester hygiene is absolutely essential in terms of harvester fires. As you see, 50% of people have had issues with uh, a harvester fire from dust and trash buildup. So we need to be blowing down regularly. And if you are having harvester fires, a more regular blow down is gonna be required. Um, uh, starting at the top uh, and the front and, and moving your way back and down is the way to go. Um, these uh, compressors, uh, high volume compressors, are definitely uh, pretty impressive bits of gear. I think they require a, a, about an 80 CFM compressor uh, to be able to do the job. Uh, the alternative is obviously um, your, a regular air, air lance, um, a piece of copper pipe a lot of people use. Um, blow down guns are, 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 are great bits of gear. Uh, they do require um, 
decent sized air, air compressors. Um, the other thing that we might want to think about keeping in the cab is uh, just a small leaf blower. Sometimes, um, you know, given that they're, they're battery powered and they're not going to stink out your cab with the smell of petrol, um, these small leaf blowers are a really useful bit of gear to, uh, to keep on board on the harvester. Um, bearings was uh, obviously the other um, the other major there, and and I'd suggest that uh, an investment in fifty or sixty dollars uh, in an infrared thermometer would be well spent. Um, you can get them at any um, car parts store uh, or even hardware stores these days. Um, how do we know what temperature a bearing should be running at? Well, look, that's that depends a little bit on the bearing and the loading that it's uh, and speed that it's running at. So, what I'd suggest to people is uh, leaving one of these uh, infrared thermometers in the cab of the harvester, uh, monitoring bearings uh, pretty regularly, and, and just keeping a bit of a log of what those bearing temperatures are going to be. Um, you're going to see uh, temperatures rise pretty quickly when uh, when failure is imminent, uh, and it will happen rapidly. So, I'd suggest if you do start to see temperatures increase, uh, think pretty carefully about doing some preventative maintenance uh, there and then rather than uh, taking the bearing to the point of failure. Uh, just as an example I, I suppose just to reiterate the, the value of these things you know as I said they're only 60 odd dollars. Um, uh, there are growers that have said uh, that you know they carry a thermometer gun in, in the car, in the harvester uh, and just in the cab and, and check their bearings every few hours. This guy in particular suggested that uh, in 2016 he would have lost his harvester had he not had that uh, had that tool and, and as I say it's a very cheap investment. Heat shielding options are something else that we could probably look at and, and looking at uh, you know some of the hot components in particular exhaust systems uh, on harvesters. Um, some could be as simple as uh, j just replacing that rough surface with a smooth finish and so it might just be a uh, high temperature paint like this one which is obviously quite cheap at about 60 bucks a litre. Um, we could also then think about uh, ceramic coatings and in fact some dealers are, are offering this to growers uh, as an option uh, for their machines. It, it does require the, the components to be pulled off the machine, sent away for treatment and then reinstalled. Um, the uh, ceramic coatings do have some insulated properties, so they will reduce the uh, the, the heat loading um, uh, on some of those components and push more of that hot air out, out the exhaust as opposed to uh, radiating it uh, in the exhaust system. Um, but the other thing it does is obviously give you a smooth finish so uh, dust is less prone to sticking uh, on, on the surface. Uh, there are products like Fiberfrax uh, and Amorphous Silica. Um, uh, that can be applied to the exhaust stream. Um, we need to be a little bit careful about how that's applied. It can, it does have to be done in, in a number of layers. Uh, it does take time to cure and we can get some linear cracking uh, once that is applied. Just again with the, the expansion and contraction of components. So you can see here in this uh, the photo on the left um, there has been some cracking in the fibre fracks there. Uh, that said the, the surface temperature obviously is, is quite low compared to uh, to the bare metal in, in operation so uh, there's some benefits and, and the disadvantages are that you might get some cracking and as you can see dust might enter those cracks and therefore cause you some issues. Other heat shielding options include uh, exhaust bandages which are obviously used pretty widely in the racing industry. Uh, look they tend to work pretty well. Sometimes they're used in combination with, with a product like Fiberfrax. Uh, I suppose one of the issues that we've seen is that they do have a rough surface and they may actually retain some dust over time. So uh, therefore, you know, by retaining that dust on a hot surface might actually cause us some grief. So uh, look, a potential if, if there's uh, some small areas, but, but also you want to make sure that that's kept very clean. Uh, heat shield and jackets uh, have been used pretty extensively uh, uh, in the mining industry for a very long time. Uh, unfortunately that hasn't transitioned terribly well across to agriculture uh, and we've seen uh, some trials of these uh, in, in particularly in South Australia in, in the lentil environment uh, fail pretty dismally and, and what's happened is that unfortunately we just because of the, the way these things um, join together uh, we have seen issues where dust uh, impregnates in under the, the joins uh, on these blankets and, and then obviously uh, is in direct contact uh, with uh, with a hot exhaust surface and, and you know, can cause incendiaries that then float down and, and start fires. 
Um, heat shields uh, and exhaust modifications, again, something that, that people have done uh, to be proactive in, in trying to prevent fires. We do need to be really careful uh, about these and, and make sure that they're removable and, and uh, that the fasteners that they're, they're fixed to the exhaust system with aren't going to trap dust themselves. Um, again, I mentioned before that harvester manufacturers spend a lot of time and money uh, making sure that the airflow across the machine is, is optimised. So we need to be cautious that we're not uh, interfering with that too much as well. Um, pressurised airflow is something that's uh, come into play in the last few years. Um, look, I, I think it's a, a, a great to see some initiative in this area. Um, a couple of things that I would point out is that uh, unfortunately we need, need that air to be really clean and, and, and pulling the air from the example of this system, uh, we could see some fine dust uh, picked up and actually pushed then onto those hot uh, components or, or fire prone components. Um, Perhaps what we need to see is the intake uh, a little higher um, and perhaps with, uh, with some pre-cleaning uh, options there as well. Um, the other thing we need to know is uh, that if we are creating areas of high pressure, we're also creating areas of low pressure. So anywhere we create a, an area of high pressure, that low pressure area will sit and we want to make sure that that isn't then going to create some, some dust pockets uh, or, or dust and trash build up in, in areas that we're not, uh, we, we didn't originally have. So I think there's a little bit more R&D required here. Um, and do, as I say, manufacturers spend a lot of time getting that, that clean airflow in mind across the engine bay. Uh, we just need to make sure that we're not going to muck that up too much. But hey, it is great to see some initiative being taken in this area. On a similar note, uh, in the US, um, some R&D there, we have seen some pressurised airflow systems that, that are pushing air um, into a, a, a sealed unit um, uh, over the hot components. And, and what this does is, is obviously creates a high pressure area uh, around the hot components, pushes the air out, um, uh, and, and stops dust ingressing into uh, into in and around those hot components. So this uh, this is some some work that's been done over there has been patented by a couple of uh, larger manufacturers. But there is an option for some R and D to be done here in Australia, I believe, uh, to have a bit of a look at, at how this this might be ad adapted to uh, to operating in Australian conditions. Uh, another option that has, has demonstrated uh, success is double skins on exhaust. Um, basically, we've got an exhaust system with an air gap with an, an additional um, uh, skin around the outside. Um, anything that's got uh, an air gap is, is typically quite uh, insulative. Uh, anecdotally, this has proven quite effective, but obviously quite expensive to also implement. We do have to think about warranty issues and, and look, I'm not going to go into uh, what each manufacturer says and doesn't say about uh, about warranty, uh, but I would suggest that it is worth chatting to your dealer about uh, any, any of these modifications you intend making, just to make sure that it doesn't uh, impact on the warranty. Uh, the, the statement here from Deere is that, uh, that uh, they do have some concerns about the loss of heat dissipation and of course what that might see is, is you know some turbo cracking uh, in the turbo housing etc. So we need to make sure that we've got that covered. Um, electrical system, uh, as I mentioned, wasn't responsible for a huge number of fires, but it's something we can do something about quite simply. Um, you know, your simple uh, electrical isolators are easy to put in line. Most harvesters have them, most new harvesters have them. If they don't, uh, they can be easily fitted. And, and so, uh, so I'd uh, strongly encourage people to, uh, to fit one of those if they haven't got one there already. Camphor can be spread throughout the machine as well, uh, just to keep rodents away. And I'd also suggest that, you know, looking at, at uh, where you might see um, issues with wiring inside corrugated conduit, those sorts of things, maybe just check uh, with other owners and, and certainly uh, keep an eye on, on some of your social media platforms for anything along those lines because they, they do spring up occasionally. Um, cameras are a great way to see what's going on, obviously the grain tank, uh, also in the engine bay and, and um, you know, a lot of those can tap into the universal terminal inside the harvester, uh, so, or stand alone. So I think they're a great option, being able to see what's going on uh, in various locations across the machine is, uh, is something that's simple to do, uh, they can be wireless, um, so you know, I, th I think that, uh, you know, visual monitoring, uh, if, if you are having some issues, uh, is definitely something that could be valuable. Um, something to mention in terms of uh, being proactive is just making sure that you're harvesting into the prevailing wind, um, making sure that uh, any uh, any incendiaries that come off the machine are blowing onto an area that's already been harvested as opposed to into the crop. Um, and I suppose along those lines, uh, we need to make sure that uh, any fuel systems uh, there that, that uh, 
uh, we're having issues with uh, hydraulic lines need to be uh, checked pretty regularly as well for, for rubbing and wear. I mentioned static before and, and suggested that static isn't responsible for, uh, for starting fires. Um, just some, some data around that um, typical static energy in a harvester might be 15 to 20 millijoules. Um, the, uh, the maximum static energy ever measured on a harvester is about 150, but to require uh, the required static energy for, for ignition is up around that 500 millijoule mark. And uh, to be quite honest, that, that's got to be done in a continuous arc. Um, to be able to get any sort of ignition and I'd suggest that there's just no way we're getting that sort of level on a harvester. The argument is though, and I, know, I totally agree that uh, one of the problems with static is that it does attract fuel um, and, uh, and while it is blamed for starting fires, I think the issue really is that, uh, that it's a hygiene issue more than anything else and, and static can, uh, can uh, attract that fuel therefore making the harvester more fire prone. Um, some questions around chains and their efficacy. Um, just in, we're operating these machines in very dry conditions, and, and look, and I think in a lot of cases it might just make us feel better to be dragging a chain. Uh, perhaps think about putting it uh, on the front as opposed to the rear axle. Um, there's been a couple of instances where where growers have driven down the road, forgotten about the chains, and uh, and started some fires as a result of dragging that chain on the bitumen. Um, one thing to just double check uh, as we're coming into harvest is that uh, things like concave doors uh, are well sealed. Um, this is an example of uh, where a concave door has been leaking and and, uh, and of course the, the concave uh, on the left hand side of the machine in a lot of cases blows up over the exhaust system uh, or sits below the exhaust system so material and, and the air pressure inside the inside the harvest can blow out the door and, and, and push uh, dust up over that exhaust which is exactly what we don't want. Uh, we can then get incendiaries just dropping down and as you can see there's been a bit of a smolder on this particular machine so um, just check those concave doors make sure they're well sealed and uh, and they're not going to push dust out, uh, out or, or or even air streams that might stir up dust and push it across the exhaust how can we be pre prepared uh, for uh, harvesting uh, to try and mitigate harvester fires? Well, the first one is obviously to uh, make sure your extinguishers are there and in good working order. Uh, I'd suggest a, a, an ABE and also a water uh, uh, extinguisher, uh, both at the steps um, uh, leading up to the cab and also at the rear of the machine. Um, what that means is you'll have uh, both uh, the appropriate extinguisher for water and or fuel fires. Um, or electrical fires uh, uh, at your fingertips at, at either end of the machine. So uh, yeah, just a couple of notes there. If you are using uh, powder uh, extinguishers, ABEs, just make sure you rotate them uh, sort of every 12 months. Just tip them up so that the, uh, the, the powder doesn't clump in the bottom and get stuck. Um, and the other thing is if you are or have used a powder extinguisher, uh, it will leak. Um, and so you need to get those recharged professionally and, and, uh, uh, and, and resealed. Um, fire suppression systems, uh, as far as I'm concerned, a great option. And, and look, we're talking anywhere between seven to fifteen thousand dollars for one of these. They can be plumbed in um, pretty easily, and they can they normally have uh, uh, a distribution system around the machine and, and some nozzles that uh, that spray on on uh, fire prone areas. Um, they can be manually triggered, uh, but the the typical system is airline triggered or electrical triggered, uh, electrically uh, triggered. So uh, both uh, trigger at about 180 degrees. So you need a reasonable fire for these to, to happen, um, and uh, and each of them uh, utilise a, a fluid tank, a pressurised fluid tank on board, um, which can then be recharged. So. Um, a, a good option uh, to, to think about a fire suppression system uh, given the value of the harvester these days. Um, fire knockout bombs, you might have seen these uh, around the place, they're available in a couple of different sizes. Um, quite a few operators are, are, are uh, installing them in the engine bay. Uh, if there is a, is, is a fire, um, this can go a long way to, to putting one out. Um, do be a little bit careful uh, if you are up there and there is a bit of a fire and, and, the, and the fire knockout bomb hasn't gone off. Uh, it could do and it could cause you some injury. So just be a little bit cautious about where you place those and also uh, you know, in operation if, if there is an issue, you don't want to be too close to it if it's going to go off. Um, obviously, uh, the GFDI, regardless of what state you're in, is is a useful uh, useful tool, and and um, and I think that uh, you know adhering to uh, a GFDI 35 um, uh, 
uh, all this, or when, when you're approaching that, is, is something to, think, to bear in mind as, as to uh, you know having a, a plan as to when you're going to pull up. I suppose the other thing is when we're talking about having a plan, I'd suggest that it's worth taking the time to chat to your harvest team about what's going to happen if there is a harvester fire. You need to have a chat about um, you know what the communication methods are going to be, and also you know who's going to alert authorities uh, and have those numbers in in the cabs of all machines. So. Um, just make sure that you're prepared uh, from a team perspective and, and you know, to avoid confusion uh, and, and uncertainty on the day. If you are in a harvester and there is a fire on board, pull out of the crop uh, into clear air as soon as possible. Face the harvester into the wind. Um, that, that example on the right hand side is what you don't want to do. Uh, and then enact your communication plan. Just alert everyone. Uh, if you've got the opportunity to use extinguishers and put that fire out, by all means go for it. Uh, but just remember that a harvester is replaceable and, uh, and people aren't. Uh, just a quick note on insurance, uh, just make sure that everything you think is covered is covered. Just, just check your policy is up to date and, uh, and covers everything uh, on that machine, uh, including uh, some of your accessories. Uh, if you are pulling up at the end of the day, just avoid parking on residue trails. Uh, as you can see here, an example of uh, where a fire has occurred in one machine and, and the residue trail has spread that to the other machines in, in, in line and, and, uh, and taken those out overnight as well. So look, uh, maybe just avoid the residue trails. Um, thermography examples here, um, uh, just from, uh, from recent experience, uh, we've got uh, a couple of images from uh, Fleur thermom Thermography Camera, uh, just of temperatures that we experience around the uh, different machines. This example is on a CR9090 uh, DPF, and as you can see, there's some very hot components there. Uh, the same CR9090 with no modifications on the exhaust stream itself and then we've got one here that's modified with exhaust wrap and a double ceramic coating. So as you can see uh, we are getting significant reduction in uh, exhaust stream temperatures there which obviously put us in good stead um, from a uh, from an ignition perspective uh, but again there's also components on that machine that we need to uh, need to also look at and, and try and keep clean uh, because insulating them just isn't an option. Uh, heat shield deflector on a, on a JDS 680 as you can see you know we are still getting hot spots there um, the idea being here that uh, we're getting air pushed around over uh, the, the top of the uh, the exhaust system there uh, whether that works or not, again, some more work to be done in that area. But as you can see, I mentioned the uh, the Larwoods modification previously, the double skin on the exhaust. Uh, this is an 8120 that's had that done. Uh, as you can see, some, uh, again, significant reduction in exhaust temperatures um, there. Uh, that's all we had for today. And, and I suppose uh, if there are any questions, my contact details are there. Um, this is the uh, final installment of the Growing Pulses in 2019 webinar series. The project will be back uh, in early 2020 with some agronomic webinar series on each of the main pulse types grown in the, in the south uh, the southern region uh, but with that i um, thank you for your interest today and uh, as i say feel free to forward any questions through to me thank you